Now, usually I like to start these videos off with an intro, but you guys saw the title. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he is going to the Dodgers on a $325 million contract, the Otani contract, because it's deferred. It is the gift that keeps on giving. Yamamoto and Otani, they are teammates yet again. I mean, if you guys don't remember, Yamamoto and Otani, they won the World Baseball Classic together when Yamamoto looked absolutely unhittable. Now, before we talk more about Yamamoto, my question for the baseball community is, what is Blake Snell going to get now that Yamamoto is making like $27 million a year because it's a 12-year, $325 million contract. I think that Blake Snell is going to get anywhere from 25 to 30. So the AAVs are probably going to match. And now that Yamamoto's got his money, I expect Blake Snell to sign within the next week or two, probably after Christmas. So before we take a look at Yoshinobu Yamamoto and his stats in Japan, look at this rotation. Out of nowhere, Yamamoto and Glasnow, they join the lineup. They have Walker Bueller Butane as a three-star with Bobby Miller, a very promising 24-year-old, almost 25-year-old, and Emmett Sheehan. I think that he's pretty good. Not as good as Ryan Pepio in that Glasnow trade. If they would have traded Emmett Sheehan as opposed to Ryan Pepio, I feel like this rotation would be one of the best in baseball. But still, on paper, Yamamoto, Glasnow, Bueller, if they're all healthy, that's an insane one through three punch. Also, I just want to mention that both the Yankees and the Mets were in on Yamamoto. Steve Cohen, they call him Uncle Steve, the owner of the Mets. He's worth like 16 to 20 billion dollars. He actually actually had an offer matched by Yamamoto, but unfortunately, he chose to go to the Dodgers. Now, one other team that was in on Yamamoto as well, the Yankees. Aaron Boone and the Yankees, they actually gave Yamamoto a jersey. I think that Hideki Matsui was there as well, so Godzilla, he was there in attendance. They were trying their best to win over Yamamoto, but the problem was, they didn't match the offer from the Mets or the Dodgers. The Yankees, they stayed at $300 million, so... Yeah, Yamamoto, he wanted to get paid, and now he's going to be teammates with Otani, so I would have done the exact same thing. Now, one team I do want to mention, the Giants. What are they doing? So they were in the running for a lot of different players, but they just haven't been able to get anyone aside from Jung Ho Lee, and their rotation going into 2024 is Logan Webb, Anthony Desclafani, who was decent to start 2023 before he fell off a cliff, Ross Stripling, Kyle Harrison, I like his ceiling, and Keaton Wynn. I mean... What are the Giants expecting out of their rotation in 2023? They better go full in on Blake Snell or one of the other available free agent starting pitchers because the Giants, they're not going to win more than 85 games with this team. Now, again, we are going to talk about Yamamoto and his ceiling, but I do want to talk about some other pitchers that the Giants or the Mets or the Yankees could be going for. Shane Bieber, we know that he is a free agent after this upcoming season and same with Corbin Burns. So both of these guys, I'm almost positive that they're going to get traded because even though the Brewers are without... Actually, now that I say that, the Brewers are going to be without Brandon Woodruff, so they kind of need Corbin Burns. Maybe Corbin Burns is not going to get traded, but hey, if you're a Yankees fan, if you're a Mets fan, if you're a Giants fan, would you rather have the services of Shane Bieber, Corbin Burns? Corbin Burns, obviously, because he's better than any of the guys that we're about to mention, Dylan Cease. You're going to have to give up more, but maybe you go for a Dylan Cease, who's not a free agent until 2026, so he's going to be in that rotation over the next few years. But in my opinion, Shane Bieber is the guy that is probably going to get traded out of the three that we just talked about, so... What do you guys think? So Otani and Yamamoto are teammates yet again, and I cannot wait to see what they do in 2025 as teammates yet again in the rotation because Yamamoto, he's essentially 5'10", Jacob deGrom, if Jacob deGrom was Japanese. So Yamamoto in seven seasons overseas, he's 75 and 30. That is 45 games over 500. And just his numbers don't make sense. He has a 1.72 ERA in seven seasons. And in the NPB, he has a 1.82 ERA with a 9.3 strikeouts per nine and a ridiculously good 6.4 hits per nine. The only problem is... The last time that we saw Yoshinobu Yamamoto in kind of a playoff atmosphere overseas, he got raked, like absolutely shelled, which kind of makes sense for Dodgers pitchers. I hate to, you know, joke, but, you know, you've had such a great year. Christmas came early. I can make a few jokes that you guys kind of stink in the playoffs when it comes to being clutch as a starting pitcher. A lot of people are saying that Yamamoto reminds them of Tim Lincecum because Tim Lincecum, he was a guy that had a smaller frame, but he used his lower half to really generate speed, and he's got that splitter in his back pocket as well, so he doesn't have to throw 100. He's going to throw 95 to 97. He's got a devastating mix of off-speed pitches with that just 
just disgusting splitter. But if you guys don't believe in Yamamoto, if you think that he's overpaid at 12 years, $325 million, let me know. Now, I do want to talk about Alex Verdugo calling out his former team, the Red Sox, and his former manager, Alex Cora. But I quickly want to ask a question. Does this signing of Yamamoto to the Dodgers, does it ruin baseball in 2024 and beyond? I've also heard that Yamamoto's contract might be backloaded, but we have no idea if that's true or not. But if he has a deferred contract and they can go out and get more, that's going to be a lot. But then again, the Dodgers, they had to have a $50 million posting fee. So his former team, Yamamoto's former team, that is, they're now owed $50 million dollars from the Dodgers so he is a very very expensive final piece of the puzzle but I mean the Dodgers they're out here playing chess not checkers they're hitting all the right buttons and in my opinion the Dodgers are probably the team to beat in the NL but do not discount the Braves the Phillies the Diamondbacks I mean heck the Arizona Diamondbacks of all teams made the Dodgers spend over one billion dollars on two players the Arizona Diamondbacks. They're on the come up as well. They got way better this offseason with Erod, Eugenio Suarez, and a couple other guys that I'm forgetting. But are the Dodgers now the Thanos of baseball? Are they inevitable? Are you not going to watch baseball in 2024 because you think that they are the Warriors of Major League Baseball when the Warriors had Kevin Durant and Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and Draymond Green all in their prime? Is it pointless? In my opinion, no. I am much more excited to watch baseball now. I think that baseball is better when the Yankees are on top, when the Dodgers are really good. We're acting like the Dodgers are super teams. Like, yeah, I'm hyping them up because they're a lot better, but the Phillies are still really good. The Braves are still really good. The Diamondbacks, I'm kind of going in circles, but those teams are elite as well. Like, honestly, I would put my money on the field because how many times does the World Series favor actually go on to win the World Series? Injuries matter. Regression is a thing. The Dodgers could very well win 100 plus games and get knocked out by the Reds and the NLDS. That could happen. So let's talk about Alex Verdugo real quick. So we know that he came from the Boston Red Sox. And if you guys don't remember, a couple months ago in August, Alex Cora kind of teed off on Mr. Verdugo because Verdugo was late to the game or something like that. And at a post-game press conference, he said, today we took a step back as a team. We have to make sure everybody is available every single day for us to get wherever we've got to go. And that wasn't the case. As a manager, I've got to take charge of this. I decided he wasn't going to play. So yeah, he called out Alex Verdugo. He tried to frame it as a team issue, but he kind of just pointed at Alex Verdugo and said, yeah, buddy, you're benched and you're the reason why the vibes are off in this clubhouse fix it. So Alex Verdugo, he got traded from Boston to the Yankees and he had a press conference yesterday and he kind of called out Alex Cora and he said that he prefers a manager like Aaron Boone, a manager that has his players backs. Watch this. Uh, for me, like I said, I'm, I'm very, very excited to, to work with Aaron. You know, I've seen the way he has his back, like has his, uh, his his players backs and you know the the one that really gets out to me is when he's like these these guys are savages you know and he's yelling at the umpire and i mean that's something i want to see out of my head coach man i want to see some fire some fight for the guys and um you know i think I think just instead of airing people out, you know, have their backs. You know who caught wind of this? Jonathan Papelbon. As you can see, I got to bleep out a few things, but uh, he is not happy that Alex Verdugo called out Alex Cora. He said that if he was playing for Cora, he would be drilling Alex Verdugo. Yeah, that is the Jonathan Papelbon that I remember. I expect nothing less from him because... He was just a fiery guy. So that's going to do it for today's recap. I know we didn't talk about a lot today, but Yamamoto, that is a big time signing, a historic signing. Otani and Yamamoto are teammates yet again. Are the Yankees going to have to settle for signing Frankie Montas on a one-year deal? What do you guys make of today's recap? Let me know your thoughts on the 2024 season. I can't wait.